We'll take the mystery out of a 12 volt buildup and put some new sounds in our street ride. Stay right there. Today on Horsepower TV, we'll fill an old swap meet 12 volt rear end with a passel of new parts, including a ring and pinion set and a posi unit. We'll show you how to make your own custom door panel, then load our 32 three window coupe with a cool stealthy sound system. We'll follow some kings of compact drag racing to Florida for some unbelievable six second quarter mile thrills and chills. So hang on for Horsepower TV. Hey, welcome to Horsepower TV, where today we got everything going on from a 12 volt rear end build up to racing and even a new sound system for our new street rod. And speaking of new rods, what do you got here? Hey, it's my new grocery getter. Now check this out. It's a rare 65 Chevelle two door wagon. And you guys are going to get to see a lot more of this thing because it's got a lot of room for upgrades. Plus, it's got a lot of room for cargo, too. In fact, I just picked up this 12 volt rear end this weekend at the swap meet. Oh, good deal. Give me a hand getting it out of there. Yeah, this is just what we need. Great. The 12 volt's been around since 1965, and with its 8 and 7 8 inch ring gear, it's a suitable high performance piece for a lot of GM applications. And since they're so abundant, well, you ought to be able to pick one up for about 100 bucks like I did. Now, even though this one is set up for a Chevelle, what we're about to show you works equally well on all 12 volts. Now, how do you spot a 12 volt when you're out shopping? Well, a lot of people think it's as simple as counting the bolts on the rear end cover like this, and well, that is a clue, but the reason they're called 12 bolts is the number of bolts that attach the ring gear to the carrier. We have seen some Oldsmobiles that had 12 bolt covers that actually use 10 bolt carriers inside. That's a good tip. Now, when you're shopping for a good usable housing, what you want to check for is any broken welds or spun axle tubes. And down here in the center section, make sure you check the races out for any pitting, galling, or any other signs of wear. And on the main caps, well, just check them out for overheating and any other obvious damage. Once you've got your housing, it's time to fill it with some parts. We're using this 342 DTS ring and pinion set, and we're going to bolt it to an Eaton Posi unit. A Posi, of course, directs power equally to both wheels and allows you to harness more of that horsepower you're making. For installation, we've got this kit from DTS that has about everything you need, including these Trick Super Shims. Now, they're stackable to give you the proper preload and backlash. There we go. Now, once your housing is clean, you can go ahead and install your new pinion races. And here's a little trick for you. Use your old race to help install the new ones. Now, if you're like us, you probably don't have a press in the shop there, so you'll have to carry your pinion down to a local machine shop to get the bearing pressed into place. Once that's done, just drop the pinion down into the housing. Since we bought a bare housing, it didn't come with a pinion yoke, so we popped for a new one. Now, if yours is worn right here in the U-joint saddle area, or you notice a groove right here around the pinion seal, well, you may want to consider replacing yours as well. While holding the pinion in place, drop in the front bearing, then the pinion yoke, washer, and nut. Since this is only a trial assembly, we're leaving the pinion seal out for now. Of course, once the nut is started, you can tighten it with an impact wrench so you get a light drag when you turn it. Well, now we can mount this ring gear to the differential. We want to make sure the mating surfaces are perfectly flat, so it's a good idea to use a file to remove any burrs or other imperfections. After you mount the ring gear, install your retaining bolts using red thread lock. Draw them down evenly and torque them down to 45 foot-pounds. The carrier bearing's next, and well, here again, you can use one of your old bearings to help drive it home. Now, I've marked both the housing and the cap to keep their locations straight. And once we get the cap out of the way, we're ready to drop in that differential. There we go. Now, once it's in place, I like to use a screwdriver to help square up those races. The super shims can be adjusted now to give us eight thousandths backlash, which is really the clearance between the ring gear and the pinion. 
adding shim thickness on the passenger side is going to increase our backlash and of course to tighten it up you add shims to the driver's side. The manual calls for a 15 thousandths preload on the carrier bearings. Now that's so that as the bearings wear your backlash doesn't go out of spec. Now once I get these caps tightened we can go ahead and run a pattern to check for tooth contact. Now to do that, we use some of this compound that comes with the kit to mark several of the teeth on the ring gear. There. Now we rotate the ring gear so that it meshes with the pinion and leaves a contact pattern. Now what you want is a nice cigar oval shape right here on the center of the tooth. It may take you several attempts to get the right contact pattern by adjusting both pinion depth and backlash. Now for that, we use this dial indicator. Now this is a crucial step for getting the maximum wear and minimum noise out of your new gear set. There, that's out. Now Joe's already removed the differential and pinion for a final assembly. So I'm going to go ahead and drop in the pinion bearing. Then we'll tap the seal into place. Then we can slide the crush sleeve over the pinion stem and slide it up into place. We use an impact wrench to compress the crush sleeve and remove all the end play from the pinion. Then we want to use a torque wrench and check the rotational drag for 20 inch pounds. We've reinstalled the differential. Now we're torquing down the main caps to 60 foot pounds. Now is also a good time to recheck your backlash. The axles we're using are Moser engineering pieces that we got from DTS. Now they're 30% stronger than stock and they use the original C clips. Oh, and don't forget, now is also a good time to install new axle bearings and seals. We're using this Trick aluminum rear end cover that doubles as a girdle now, it's specially reinforced, and these load bolts actually contact the caps on the rear end for extra support. Now we're going to go ahead and torque down the retaining bolts to 25 foot-pounds. Hey, by the way, the Eaton Posi we put in this thing uses carbon fiber clutches, so you don't need any extra additives. But remember, DTS recommends using a petroleum-based gear loop for a 500-mile break-in. Well, that about wraps up our 12-bolt buildup. Now, you can plan on spending a day in the driveway and about $1,000 for everything that we've shown you here. Now, I think it's time for us to get our rear end gear and take a little bit of a break. We'll be right back. Next, imports are hotter than ever, and we'll head to a red-hot import race at Barroso. Stay tuned. Horsepower TV's Race of the Week is brought to you by Edelbrock, the leader in automotive performance for nearly 75 years. Welcome to Barroso Motorsports Park and a Millennium matchup among some of the quickest sport compacts in the country. And love it or not, it's the fastest growing segment of American drag racing. Every time we come out to an event, the, the stands get bigger and bigger and bigger and more you know, big manufacturers are getting involved, so it's definitely here to stay. This event is sanctioned by the National Import Racing Association, and the competitors come from all walks of life, although most are young and grew up with Hondas and Toyotas in their driveways instead of Chevys and Fords. Well, that is with few exceptions. I love it. Take a shot of the engine. The last one I had was a Mustang. You know, when I get people oh, one of these, I, I get rid of the Mustang and got this. At Saturday's time trials, racers in seven classes lay down their numbers. Some powered from the front, others from the rear. Some nudging their sport compacts with nitrous, while for others, the main power adder of choice is a twin turbo. Some of the rear wheel racers were hitting eight second ETs, like Brandon Alvarez, who that night almost hit the wall. I don't know, Joe, the minute I put second gear, it just got away on me, stood on two wheels, and luckily nothing happened after that. Now, 
Now, one of the most exciting classes has to be Pro Front Wheel. With all the power you can pack into a four-cylinder engine and all the power you can plant onto those two front slicks. In fact, some of the country's quickest Pro Front Wheelers are here. All 10-second cars and most capable of hitting that elusive nine-second mark. One of them is Angel Robles, who was driving Mustangs recently until he joined the Brayman team, who put him behind the wheel of a 94 turbo-powered Civic. It's pretty amazing. It's, it's different from what I'm, what I'm used to, uh, driving a rear-wheel drive car. Um, the sensation's completely different. Um, the car on the top end is just unreal. When you hit third gear, it just it pulls insane. It's a unique feeling. Well, if we're going to see one of these front-wheel missiles hit the nines today, it won't just be because it makes power. Many of the four-cylinder dual overhead cam motors can make 600 horses. The challenge is putting that power down. That's why the booming sport is sprouting all sorts of innovations in suspension technology, like Chris Rado's team, who's developed a wheelie bar that actually is a CO2-powered pneumatic traction bar. Instead of having a fixed bar that they set next to the track, we have made our bars uh, active. In other words, our bars are pneumatic. So after I do my burnout and before, right before I pull up the stage, I have uh, a CO2 tank and I have an actuator in here. I flip a switch, the wheelie bars come down, weight jack all the weight from the car to the front tires off the rear so that when it tries to transfer the weight, the bars are pushing down real hard and pushing that power down those front tires. In fourth gear, we have a speed sensor set up and a little controller, and I can, I can change whatever vehicle speed I want. When it gets to a set vehicle speed, the bars come up automatically. Now, if for some reason I have a problem or for whatever reason I, don't, I want the bars to, to come down, I pick them up any time going down the track. And with racers getting more and more power out of these cars, that's an important safety feature. On the way back to the track, we caught a peek at the compact car show and shine that wasn't so compact. Hundreds of bright ideas were on display which reflect the growing aftermarket for cool, colorful cosmetics. All over the midway at Moroso, you could hear talk about how this is the future of streetcar high performance. And with Southern Florida's Hispanic population embracing it so ardently, well, you hear it in a couple of different languages. Bueno, nosotros aquí en Moroso Motorsport Car, car estamos muy felices por el crecimiento de las carreras de carros importados. Which in English means uh, import racing rocks or something like that. With the stands and rails full of eager spectators, eliminations were well underway with the lingering questions still in the air. Will we get to see that elusive six-second quarter-mile run? That's the latest milestone among these pro front-wheel warriors. And thanks to the Brayman team, the answer was yes. Robles ran a 998 at 144 miles an hour in his Civic on his way to the finals. His winning time in the finals was a slower 1015 at 141, but enough to beat Steve Thompson in his 92 Civic. I'm really happy that I hit nines and um, that I was able to, to ultimately win it. Next stop, eight second runs. Sure, it'll happen soon, thanks to evolving technology that'll further bridge the gap between making more power and planning. For the latest news on Horsepower TV, check us out online at horsepowertv.com. Even though we're building a Retro Rod 32, we're going to give it a high-tech sound system today. After all, rocking and rolling are about as classic as tail fins and bobby socks. Now, we're going to install a concealed system consisting of acoustic CD head and their 160-watt amp. Then we're going to use a couple of crossovers that are hooked to a speaker component system comprised of five and a quarter woofers and some one inch tweeters. The first step is to identify the locations for your components. Now, eventually a custom console is going to conceal our head unit right here between the seats. But since it's not built yet, we're just going to wire it in for right now. Of course, the amp needs a lot of air circulation to help keep it cool, and we're going to bolt it in right here beneath the passenger seat. 
of course, to get the most out of our woofers, we're going to mount them on this panel right here behind the seats. That way the trunk can act as an acoustic chamber. And finally, the tweeters are going to get mounted right up here on this headliner trim piece. I've removed the passenger seat to give us a little bit better access. Now, wiring up the system isn't all that difficult, but for best sound reproduction, you want to make sure you use high quality power and speaker wires. Oh, and make sure that you keep all of them well separated to eliminate any possibility of electrical interference. Now, I've marked the tweeter location on the panel here and we're cutting it out with a hole saw. Well, now we're ready for the woofers, and I've marked the back of the panel here for the speaker locations. We'll cut those out with a hole saw, too. Well, that just about takes care of our tunes. As you can tell, buying and installing a high-tech stereo is a sound decision that anybody can make. Well, I hope you decide to stick around with us. We'll be back right after this. Hey, want to see a door go from this to this? Well, we can't make you an expert at upholstery, but we can show you how to make a custom door panel just like this and save yourself a thousand. Oh, I got your attention now? Well, listen up, because class is in session. A postry class, that is. Wyoming Tech instructor Kim Helgeson's about to take us through the steps of creating a cool two-color trim panel. And what we have here is a, a graphic design that we're planning on doing the, on the outside of a 61 Volkswagen Bug. So we're gonna try to come up with a design that'll look, that will complement it on the interior. Kim first traces the entire panel on a piece of poster board. By the way, he also needs to measure to allow correct spacing for the B-pillar. He likes to use tape to draw the design, but some guys, of course, use a pencil. Then he cuts out the various pieces before sliding a piece of aluminum to start making a template for a separate colored panel. After cutting out the template, he drills several holes and drops in T-nuts and glues them into place. Then on to cut out pieces for the bottom layer pattern. He drops a sheet of quarter inch foam under the cutout poster board and cuts out a foam insert. The door panel goes back onto the table where Kim and his helper tape down the insert before spraying everything with glue. Now he lays the foam shell the insert was cut out from onto the sticky panel and pulls away the insert to reveal the real design he was after. After trimming around the edges of the panel itself, he's ready to start marking and cutting away foam pieces for the darker fabric design, again using the aluminum piece as a template. Next, Kim sprays glue onto the bottom trim panel fabric before hand shaping it around the design. While he was doing that, I glued the darker fabric to the aluminum template for the second layer. Pretty cool, huh? We'll put some screws in from the back side right into in those T-nuts. Tie these two pieces together, put some clips around the outside edge here, and we'll be ready to hang this thing on the car. Man, what a trick touch for this hot rod bug, Kim, but uh, when are those bucket seats going to be ready? You know, I think they're just about ready, Joe. <laughs> Good. Stay with us. Hot Parts is next. Man, I can't see over this thing. Horsepower's Hot Parts, brought to you by Summit Racing Equipment, your source for high-performance parts for 30 years. Hey, you big block Mopar guys will really appreciate this billet aluminum electric water pump from CSI. Now, it pumps 40 gallons per minute, and it only weighs about 5 pounds. This unique anodized finish is a CSI first, and it's built to last with a heavy-duty impeller on a stainless steel shaft. Now, you can pick one of these up, or about 400 bucks. Well, you can pick up some extra protection for your hands and keep them clean at the same time with these disposable nitro rubber gloves from AC Delco. Their super thin design lets you feel everything you work on, and these textured fingertips here, well, they'll give you some extra gripping power. 
Now, these rip resistant gloves won't rip off your budget. A box of 100 sells for less than seven bucks. Well, here's something that'll help you get it together. The engine and transmission, that is. It's a transport cradle from Motofeet that allows you to keep the engine and transmission bolted together for either storage or transport. Now, the powder-coated frame accepts these optional casters, and they're available for most popular engines. The price is pretty popular, too. How does 55 bucks for a starter sound to you? Hey, I'll buy that. And we'd like to sell you on next week's show. Here's a look. We'll get our hands dirty hopping up a Harley with a passel of parts designed to drastically pump up the power. In fact, you'll be astounded at the results we get on the dyno jet. In our race of the week, it's the NSCA Southern Shootout in Darlington, featuring America's fastest streetcars, where you'll ride inside some of these six-second land missiles. This next fast two drives out, it's gonna rock and roll. And remember, high performance fun is what this show's all about. I think it's about time you took me for a ride in your new grocery getter. Well, I'll fly if you buy. For information about the products used in today's show and more, check us out online at horsepowertv.com. Horsepower TV is an RTM production.